Hey everyone, Kevin P. McAuliffe here, and I am back again with another Creative Cow tutorial. And in our ongoing look at learning Avid's Media Composer and Symphony, we're going to continue our look at settings. And in this tutorial, we're going to take a look at our Composer settings. And you'll remember we finished up in our last lesson taking a look at capturing and the capture settings. Now remember, we're not going to go in and take a look at every setting inside the settings tab. We just want to take a look at the settings that are important to get you up and running as quickly as possible. Okay, not a long introduction. Let's just get into Symphony and let's get started. Okay, so let's Alt tab into Symphony. Now that's obviously a command tab for all of my Mac friends out there. And you'll see we are now in Symphony. And I said that we're going to start by talking about our composer settings. Now, if you take a look right at your main preview and record window, if you take a look right at the top of the window, you're going to see that this is the composer window. So the settings that we're setting right now are going to directly impact this window here. Now, obviously, to get to our settings, we're simply going to navigate over to the project to the settings tab. You'll remember that we ended off with capture and we're going to come right down to composer. Basically, what I'm going to do is double click on Composer, and we're really going to focus on the first window inside of the Composer settings, titled appropriately enough, Window. Now, you're going to see the very first category that we have is the data display at the top. Now, I think before I show this, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to open a couple other bins here. Let's get some stock footage happening here. Maybe we'll take some gliding footage. And what I want to do is just to create a very basic rough sequence here. And you're going to see why in just a second. What I'm going to do is just hit B to edit that clip into my keyboard. I'm going to press Control and Y on Windows, Command and Y on the Mac to create a new layer. Now you're going to notice that as I go along, we haven't really talked specifically about editing, but you're getting all these little tidbits to build up to when we actually do talk about editing. What I also want to point out is that believe it or not, I've actually already covered editing inside a Media Composer. If you go back and you take a look at my tutorials inside of the Creative Cow, you're going to find that I did five tutorials. They actually make up a little series to basically get you kick-started in learning Media Composer, and one of those tutorials is specifically on editing. So if you want to skip ahead a little bit, feel free to go back and check out some older tutorials where you'll get sort of a really basic overview of editing inside of Media Composer and Symphony. Like I said, don't worry, we're going to get to editing soon enough, but I want to make sure that you have these core fundamentals down before we get into it, because it's very important to understand the basics before you move on. Okay, so let's just grab another gliding clip here. Sure, we'll grab this one. And what I'm going to do here is just come in. I'm going to drop this into video two. I'll just simply again hit B on the keyboard. It doesn't really matter what I have selected here or what, uh, what area of the timeline that I'm editing these into. I'll just create a new layer again, Control and Y on Windows, Command and Y on the Mac. Maybe I'll just grab a boxing clip here. Why not? Sure, we'll just grab that one. We're going to edit this on to video layer three. There we go. It doesn't even need to be that long. I think that's a little bit too long. So let's just remove that. Now, basically those composer settings, and let's just head back to them right now for just one second here. Composer, there we go. These composer settings are basically used to give us more or less information when we're working inside of Symphony or Media Composer. Now again, I'm just going to close this window. You're going to notice at the top of the composer window, I have some information that's being displayed. I have some information on the left, some information in the center, and some information on the right. Now let's start with this center information first. What does this basically represent? You'll see right now it says that it's minus one, one second, and two frames. Well, what that is basically telling me is that if you take a look at my sequence, I actually have an endpoint marked right here. What this is actually telling me is that I'm actually a second and two frames behind that endpoint. What this actually is, is the center duration. So for example, if I come back and I mark an endpoint right here, I'm just going to navigate down, I'm going to mark an out point right there. The duration in between that in and out point is actually one second and 15 frames. Now this is one of the settings inside of Composer settings that I'm going to show you in just a second. But what you're also going to see over here is that I have something called MAS and I have a time code value. Well, MAS stands for master appropriately enough. You'll see if I come back to the beginning of the timeline, right now the time code of this sequence is set to start at the one hour mark. Now what I'm going to do here is just come back to my bins here for one second because I think I have this sequence inside the gliding bin. So let's just open our Learn Media Composer bin. And I'm just going to stick that sequence in there just so I can close these other two bins just for a second. And we're going to come back here. And I'm just going to name this Layered Sequence. 
And of course, I have my clips view here. There we go. Very nice. You'll see I have the start and the end. And like I said before, what this represents is the starting time code of this sequence. Now, what if I wanted to actually get in and change that? Well, it's actually very easy to do. The easiest way to do is to simply right click inside of your record window and navigate down to sequence report. Inside a sequence report, you'll see right here, I have my starting time code. All I'd have to do if I wanted to change that to, let's say, uh, one hour and one minute, I could just punch in 01, 01, and then I can hit the period key right down at the bottom of the numeric pad twice to put in two sets of double zeros. What I'm going to do is not say generate report. I'm actually going to say apply changes. And as soon as I do, you'll see the time code value of my sequence up here change. And now I can simply hit cancel and I can drag down and you'll see that that new time code is now reflected inside of my sequence. Now, that's obviously telling me information about this clip, or in this case, this sequence that's inside of the record window. But what I want to do here is I'm just going to call back up a clip here into the preview window because you're going to see that I also have a time code value right here. And you'll see what it's telling me is right now, video track one, you'll see that I only have one video track. It has a time code value of one hour, 10 seconds, and 21 frames. This value could really be anything based on how this clip was imported. If it was digitized, it's obviously going to reflect the time code on the tape. If it's imported, it's going to be reflective of whatever the time code associated with that QuickTime or whatever type of file it happened to be. Now, like I said, in this case, it's 1 hour and 10 seconds and 21 frames. But here's where something gets a little bit interesting. This is pretty straightforward. I only have one layer of video. And you'll see I can come up and I can actually drop this down. And you'll see right down here at the bottom, the source tracks. Right now it's telling me, well, hold on, you only have one video track. But if I had, let's say, eight audio tracks, I would see time code values for all of those eight audio tracks right below the video track. You'll also see that I can get in and see the duration of the clip, the in-out, the absolute, and the remaining duration on this clip. You'll see I can also come up to the source and get more information on this clip. Now, like I said before, this is based on this clip only. Right now, the master is based on the sequence. But what if I wanted to get in and see information based on these clips? Well, I can actually do that. You'll see if I navigate up to the top, I have a little drop down called the tracking information menu. If I drop that down, what this is going to give me is the same information I had over here inside the preview window. But you'll see that I can actually get in and see the time code values of all of the clips, whatever, wherever I happen to be parked inside of my timeline. You'll see I have three video tracks. I can actually see the time code information for those three video tracks. Now, in this case, let me just delete the audio because I don't have any audio in my timeline. What we're going to do is navigate right back up to the top. So you'll see I can now get in and say, oh, OK, you know what? If a producer comes to me and says, hey, well, what's the, the time code of the frame that we're parked on right now? I can say, you know what? No problem. It's, you know, it's one hour, four seconds, and 24 frames. This is a great way to get in and get a lot of information about whatever the clips happen to be where you're parked in your timeline. Now, let's jump back for a second. We were talking about our composer settings. So let's go back into the composer settings because you're going to see how all this ties together right now. I'm going to come back to the settings. I'm going to come down to composer. You'll remember the very first thing we talked about was the center duration. Well, guess what? There's the option for center duration right there. If I turn that off and say OK, the center duration disappears. But you know what? I like having the center duration. More information is always a good thing. You'll see we have all these little tick bars inside of each one of the playback regions in our preview and in our record window. I can come in and I can turn those off. So you'll see we don't have those anymore. Personally, I actually like them. What I'm going to do is just turn that back on. And what we were just talking about was the information at the top of the preview and of the record window. And you'll see right here, the data display at the top can be off, not give us any information, have one row of data, have two rows of data, or flow dynamically. Now, which one do you want to choose? Well, for me personally, I normally like to display two rows of data. I'm going to say OK, because you'll see right now, both of these are set to the master time code. Well, normally for me, I don't normally have video clips on different tracks unless they're actually effects. So what I normally like to do is I like to say, OK, you know what? Show me the master time code and show me the time code of the clip that's on video track one. So for example, let's just take this here, drag it down like such. We'll take this clip here, drag it down like such, just so we have a little edit going on. Because now if I'm going through and the producer says, you know what? Hold on, stop that shot right there. What's the time code of that shot? I can come up and it will tell me right here immediately. I don't need to go looking for it or anything like that. You can see how having the two rows of information is hugely beneficial. 
Now you'll remember if I come back over to my composer settings that I did have one more option under data display at top and that was to flow the data dynamically. Now what exactly does that mean? Well, let's say you have, you know, I have one monitor now, but you might have two monitors. You may want to adjust the size of your composer window. Basically, by adjusting the size of your composer window, what's going to happen is, is that the data at the top is going to either show you more or less depending on the size of your displays or your monitors here, your composer window. So keep that in mind. Now, for me, normally how I like to work, like I said, I always like to have the two rows of data displayed at all times. For me, it's just how I prefer to work because I've pretty much always worked like that. It's something that I highly recommend you get into the habit of doing just because it's going to give you the most amount of information you could possibly need at one time. Now, next right below that, we have the button displays at the bottom. Now, what does that mean? Well, you'll see right now I have two rows of buttons. Now, for me, normally because I work with my left hand on the keyboard, my right hand on the mouse, I normally will only ever use one row of buttons. So what I'm going to do is simply select one row of buttons, and I'm simply going to say OK. You'll see I now have just one row of buttons ready to work with if I need to. It's very rare that you see me go up and actually click on these buttons, like I said, because most of the work I do, I'm going to do with my left hand on the keyboard. So if you have any questions, you have any comments, or you have any tutorial requests, you can send them to Kevin P. McAuliffe at gmail.com. This has been Kevin P. McAuliffe. Thanks a lot for watching.